We turn again to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, please. <coughs> this will be the, the last um, talk in this series uh, until the summer's over. So we uh, get a break from Max for a couple of months. And then the men will be looking to the men to bring us exhortation every week, Lord willing. And we'll just pray before we read. Father, we're thankful for your word. Thankful for everything that we've heard from it, even this morning already. And we're thankful for the blessing that it brings us. We ask that you would help us this morning as we open your word again, um, just to to take it in, to to take heed, and Father, that it might be a blessing to us this morning. We ask this in the Saviour's name. Amen. Acts chapter nine. We're reading from verse nineteen to thirty-one. <clears throat> and when he had received meat, that's Paul, or Saul, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent? that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying a wait was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night, and let him down by the wall in the basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he is said to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the, the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Now go back to verse 9. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. He was three days without sight, neither did he eat. Or a drink. I wonder if I was to ask you, have you ever gone three days without food and water? There wouldn't be too many put their hand up, I wouldn't think. Um, sometimes we miss a meal and, and we, we get grumpy, maybe. We actually missed a meal yesterday and, and the word starving was mentioned a few times, you know. Um, but we're, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We can't do without food. We can't do without water. And we'll, we'll last about three weeks without food. And then our body will shut down, start to shut down. But only three to five days without water. And everything will start to shut down. You know, Paul would have felt um, so weak 
even probably ill at this stage. And at this stage, he probably would have ate nearly anything. He would have ate nearly anything. In a way, he would have been able to go and see three days without food. But I want us to just do, just in passing, I want us to look at verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. You know, the first thing Paul done um, after he had received his sight, it wasn't to go and look for food, but it was to be baptized. Just to leave that with you, that baptism is important, and it was important to uh, Paul. I want to look at um, four buts in this passage. And there's one verse 21, 22, 24, and 27. I want you to keep in mind um, our physical need for food and water. Yeah, we'll return to that later. Um, it says here in, in verse 21, But all that heard him were amazed. And here we have Paul... Um, the one who was actually having Christians put to death, having them beaten, scourged, everything, thrown to lands, whatever. And here we have him actually preaching that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And there's actually, this is a sense of negativity in their amazement. You know, it wasn't the same amazement that they had with Peter and John when they'd done these miracles and, and thousands of people were saved. Um, here, the people didn't actually believe that he was genuine. They just were amazed that this man would come and preach in the name of the Lord Jesus, the one who he had persecuted. So they didn't believe he was genuine at all. And we don't read of anybody actually believing or trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ at this stage through Paul's preaching. There wasn't the hundreds and thousands that we read about Peter and John. But then verse 22 sorry, says, But Paul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt at Damascus proving that this was the very Christ. Paul spent a bit of time with, uh, with the believers, maybe in Damascus, and he was preaching in the synagogues and the streets and wherever, and people actually didn't believe him, that he was genuine. I want us to turn to Galatians chapter 1, please. <clears throat> During his time in Damascus, you see, Paul, um, he leaves Damascus and he goes to Arabia. And he doesn't mention it here, it's not mentioned here in Acts, Luke doesn't mention it. But we get, we get it in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15 we'll read from. This is Paul speaking. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and then returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. See, there was a time when Saul got apart with the Lord. And I believe that's where this comes in, where Saul was increased 
in strength. Maybe you believe it happened somewhere else in this passage. And um, it does say in verse 23, after many days were fulfilled, some people believe that he went to Arabia in, in that time. But I personally believe that he went and he was increased the more in strength. And when he came back, he was able to confound the Jews. He was able to win every debate with them about the Lord Jesus Christ. You can imagine, uh, you can imagine that the Apostle Paul, who knew the Old Testament scriptures inside out, and going to be with alone with the Lord and, and getting down and reading those scriptures again. But this time, seeing the, the Lord Jesus in every one of them, and how that would have changed this man's life, and changed his perspective, changed his, even his preaching, that he went and he was alone with the Lord and studying the word and praying and just being alone with the Lord and a real desire, you know, to see the Lord Jesus in every scripture. The Old Testament would have made perfect sense to him now. And before it maybe didn't mean that much. He was, he was expected to learn it because he was a Pharisee. He would have recited it many times. He would have memorized it. But now it meant so much to him. And even, even chapters like Isaiah 53 would have been real to him. Um, before, Paul would never have thought of the Messiah being wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. They would have thought the Messiah would have come in power and just uh, wiped out the Roman government and, and restored Israel to its former glory. But here, this, now Paul realizes that the Messiah has come and he's suffered for sin. And what a what an insight into the scripture he, he has got. Um, and I believe this is where Saul was strengthened in the scriptures. I'm thinking about our physical needs. Um, I want us to think about our spiritual needs this morning. And I want to ask m myself first and then yourselves. Have we ever gone three days without reading? without praying. You know, it's often been said that seven days without prayer makes one week. It'll certainly not give you any strength. It'll make us weak. And if we aren't reading, if we aren't praying, it's the same as our physical needs. Our bodies, um, our bodies will crave that, that food, that natural food. But if we're not reading and praying, our very souls, our very minds are going to suffer. Um, we still have that old nature within us. And if we don't feed it with good spiritual food, then very often we feed it with junk food. And as in the physical, there's plenty of junk food out there. So in the spiritual, there's plenty of junk food out there. And our minds can be filled with rubbish. The psalmist says, Behold, thou desirest truth in my inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And he says in Psalm 119, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And light unto my path. Chapter 19, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Romans 12 and 2. And be not conformed to this word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ephesians 5. 25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved also the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. By the word. You know, the Bible and the word of God is described as 
bread and as water our spiritual needs food and water and one of the many benefits of water is its cleansing ability um, not only on our bodies we wash ourselves to be clean but in our bodies the water purifies um, us within and so it is with the word of God and the water of the word will cleanse us from within it washes us deep down in our souls and it purifies our thoughts and our motives and it cleanses us as we absorb it and obey its truths you know our minds are always active our minds are always active even when we're sleeping I'm sure you've been waking um, those who, who don't live in their own or whatever you've been waking by somebody maybe in the next room maybe talking in their sleep having a dream whatever and our minds are always active um, and if our minds are changed we will change if our minds are changed we will change so we must be feeding it on the word of truth you know our souls have been redeemed but our bodies have not yet been redeemed and our minds can still be affected by this world very much so affected by this world we're still open to distraction and even strain um, from our first love you know our children are exposed to so much and there's never been a time ever when there's so much rubbish uh, to be to be got really available and our children are soaking up like little sponges and these things not just rubbish they're serious many times they're dangerous and they're going to form our children's minds and they're going to affect our children's future we need the word of God we need it to cleanse our minds to cleanse us we've been thinking about the blood this morning cleansing us from all sin and it goes on cleansing us but we need to be reading the word getting the word into our minds into our hearts to cleanse us the food of the food of the word for growth the water of the word for cleansing if I was to ask you round uh, for dinner and set you down at the table and lift your knife and fork and start to feed you um, you would be a bit offended wouldn't you and so it is with the word don't expect someone else to feed you we need to get into it ourselves it's personal it's for each one of us it's what God wants for us each day to read it and to get advice to get encouragement to get blessing and it's just it's something that we neglect isn't it we don't read it as we should prayer is such a privilege we don't use it as we should may God help us to read his word and to pray more but so increased the more in strength I believe from reading the scriptures and being with God and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus proving that this is the very Christ go to, go to Acts chapter 18 
verse 28. Acts 18, 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. You know, there's more than one way that we can prove to the world that Jesus is the Christ. Now, first of all, we can prove by the scriptures. As Paul, if Paul can do it, we can do it. Proven by the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ and was the Christ. But also, as we've been thinking about this morning, our walk. And Ephesians 4 tells us we're to walk worthy. We're to walk worthy of the high calling. First John chapter 2 and verse 6 says we're to walk even as he walked. And... It's a challenge to to me, at least, and I'm sure it's a challenge to you, the people that we meet, our neighbours, those that we work with. Could they say about us that that person has proved to me that, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? By their life, by their walk, by what they read, by what they've read to me, and they're proving that Jesus is the very Christ. But you know, all, with all, all of Paul's preaching and, and his sincerity, and his actually debating with the, the Jewish people, proving that this was the very Christ, you know, they the, the took counsel to kill him. You know, I believe here that Paul was trying to do God's will um, in reverse. In reverse. He was, he was winning all the debates here, but he was losing the war. Um, everything that they had threw at him, he, he had a scripture for it. Um, he knew the scriptures, but he had seen now that Christ in every one of them, and he was proving to them that Christ was the Son of God. Just turn to Acts 22 and we'll just... Um, show you what I'm thinking about. Acts 22. In verse 17. The clock's flying here. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in the trance, and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for, the, for they will not receive thy testimony. Concerning me, verse 21, Depart, for I will send thee far thence unto the Gentiles. And, and Paul here, I believe Paul was, was sure that God would have him speak to the Jewish people first. And because who, has, who better knew them than himself? He was a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee, brought up, knew the Jewish religion inside out. And I believed that he thought God had called him to go there first, but I don't think that's the case. God had called him to go to the Gentiles. And if you read back in, in, in verse 15 of chapter 9, um, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, and then the kings and the children of Israel. So Paul's calling was to the Gentiles. Number, th number 20, verse 24, we see that the third, but, but they're lying awake was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. They will not take time to go there, but if you read in, in, in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul is actually speaking about uh, things he would glory in. And this is one of the things he mentions. Um, he, he's actually glorying in his weakness, in his infirmities, that he was actually humiliated here in Damascus. And Paul, the Pharisee, the man who was re well respected by all the Jewish people, was let down in the basket and had to flee from Damascus. Um, if you read that, you can read that in Second Corinthians uh, chapter 11. 
And we'll just we'll rush on here. Um, verse 27, it says, But Barnabas took him. Uh, you know, Paul had tried to join himself to, to the believers in Jerusalem, but they didn't believe him, and, and you couldn't actually blame them in some sense. They, they didn't believe that he was the disciple. And sometimes it's hard for us to to deal with a person's past, maybe. And sometimes we find it hard to forgive, even though God has forgiven. Um, especially here in Saul's case, where, where murder, murder was on his record. And maybe even friends of these people. Maybe Paul had murdered some of his friends and even maybe got them beaten or whatever. But most certainly they were brothers and sisters in Christ of these people. And they were right to be cautious. They were right to be cautious because um, the Lord himself says, Beware of false prophets. It's come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And so we have to be cautious. Anybody who comes in to our, to our assembly or whatever, who wants to join with us, we have to be cautious. Because they could be uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, in relation to Paul and, and this uh, passage here, to bring it to ourselves, um, Somebody we think of, somebody who is, who is bad, maybe we think of in our minds is Vladimir Putin, maybe. Would we believe him if he came in here and said he was forgiven, if he, he was saved? That he had been born again, that he wanted to meet with us? Do we believe God can change men like that? Do we want him to be forgiven? Do we want Vladimir Putin to be forgiven? Do we want him to be in heaven? Or do we just say within ourselves, he deserves to rot in hell? And this is probably what was going through these believers' minds. They probably didn't want Saul to be forgiven. They probably didn't want him to be a disciple as such. But we're thankful for the buts of scripture. Here we have verse 27. But Barnabas took him. Barnabas had witnessed a change in Saul um, that only God could do. Only God could perform this wonderful miracle. And, and Barnabas, his name actually means the son of encouragement. And Addy was, was reminding us this morning that we need encouragement in these days that we live in. We need men like Barnabas. We need men who actually believe in us, really. And who give us encouragement to go on and to help us. And here Barnabas takes Saul and he brings him to the disciples and he explains to them the wonderful change that has been wrought in Saul's life. I'm just going to finish at verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Samaria. But the, the, the sent Saul away, and sent him to Caesarea, and then down to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and, and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Walking in the fear of the Lord. You know, in, in the days we live in, the fear of the Lord is diminishing rapidly. Rapidly right across this world. And I don't mean just in the secular world, I mean in, in believers right across the world. This also know that in, in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of the, their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. We're thankful that these believers were walking in the fear of the Lord. They had 
And this isn't just respect. This is reverence for a holy God and everything that the scripture says about him, who he is, and how powerful he is, and the one who we are subject to, the one we are, who we are to obey. I said they had comfort in the Holy Spirit. And we all like our comforts. We all like our own bed. We all like the chair we sit in. We all like maybe to sit out the back at times. We all like somewhere comfortable. Well, it doesn't matter if you're in the most comfortable place in, in this world. If you're not comfort, comfortable in your mind and in your heart, by the Holy Spirit, you've got absolutely nothing. You've got nothing. These believers, they were comforted by the Holy Spirit. They were edified. They were built up. But it says they were multiplied. They were comfortable, but they weren't complacent. And um, they, were, they were out reaching other people for the Lord. But just trust that God will bless his word to your hearts. We'll just pray. Father, we just pray that you would speak to us this morning. That you would help us to get our priorities right as it were and to be reading our, our Bible to be praying much um, to be on our knees before thee thankful for these privileges that we have and we just pray that in these days lay ahead that we will cherish them as privileges the word of God and able to approach the throne of grace we just pray Father that you would help us as we leave here, pray for the meeting tonight. Pray for Sammy as we come to speak. We ask that you speak to those in the meeting not saved, those that will be in, in your will. We ask that you bring us to our homes and safety. We ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen.